Check, check. How's everybody doing? Good. How's everybody doing? Good. What's up, Rise Up? Thanks for joining us on Instagram. Make sure to like this live video. I don't even know if that's a thing. I don't have Instagram, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing? Okay, all right. good. All right, awesome, you guys. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Paul. Okay, easy to remember. Super just simple, P-A-U-L, all right? And tonight, we're gonna be talking about the story of Jacob. Raise your hand if you've heard of Jacob in the Bible before. Yeah, some of you, yes and no, pretty sure. Okay, so this is debatably one of the craziest stories in the whole Bible. And the more you read the Bible, you're gonna find out that there's nothing but crazy stories, okay? But the story of Jacob is one that I encourage you to find yourself in tonight, okay? I don't know if anyone's ever told you this before, but what's awesome about the Bible is that it's not just a book that we read to say that we read it, okay? The Bible is God's work to you, okay, and to me. And when we read these stories and we learn about the Bible, it's not just to learn about a story or a certain man or woman. We're supposed to find ourselves in the scripture, okay? And what does that mean? Well, to find yourself in the scripture means to let God's word speak to you. Okay, these stories and these people were used by God and included in his word so that you could identify with these people. Because they're just that. They're people. They're like me and you. They're born. They make mistakes. They're imperfect. But God uses them just like he uses us. Not based on our own goodness, but on, on the goodness of God. Amen? So tonight we're going to talk about the story of Jacob. And here's the thing, you guys. You're going to get... You're going to realize this very fast. The story of Jacob is very large, okay? It's like 10 chapters. So we're not going to cover 10 chapters tonight. But what I want to do is, first of all, just break down some different things, some highlights of Jacob's life so that we can get familiar with his character and who he was and what God did with him. But then I, at the end, want to focus on a specific thing that happened to Jacob because I feel like the Lord really wants to impress this on each of you tonight, okay? And I want to also say, just being honest, this story, what we're going to press on tonight, is one of the most heart-wrenching stories. It, it, it's one of the stories in the Bible that's affected me most in my walk of faith with the Lord. So I'm hopeful that it will do just that for you tonight as well. All right? So first, I just like to pray over what we're going to talk about, over the scripture. I just want to pray over this night for each of you being here. Okay? So just bow your heads if you will. Thank you, Father. Thank you for every single person here tonight. Thank you that they are not here by mistake. They're not here by accident. They're not here because they were forced to. Maybe they think that. But Lord, you're going to speak something tonight to these teens that is going to encourage them, that's going to light a fire on the inside of them, and you're going to teach your children tonight in the name of Jesus. So I just pray that we have good soil in our hearts to receive the word of God that we all learn something tonight about our, our awesome, awesome God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Awesome. So again, we're going to go through the story of Jacob, somewhat paraphrasing. Like I said, I can't cover 12 chapters with you guys tonight. So we're going to start at the beginning and just touch on all the most important parts of his life. And then again, at the end, we're going to really focus on one of those events. Okay. So does anybody know who Jacob is? Who's Jacob's dad? Anybody know? Anybody here last week? Who's Jacob's dad? Go ahead. Anybody? Oh, no one paying attention. Who is it? Isaac. Good job. Exactly. Good job. That's right, Isaac. So Isaac is Jacob's dad, and Abraham was Isaac's dad, right? So we're kind of breaking down the genealogy of Abraham. Right? So it went Abraham and then Isaac. Now we're at Jacob. Okay? So, first of all, Isaac and Rebekah are the ones who got together and they became pregnant with twins. Okay? So Jacob was not alone. He had a twin brother. Anybody know twin brother of Jacob? His name is Esau. Okay? So there was Jacob and Esau that Isaac and Rebekah were pregnant with. Now, in the story of Jacob, when we're reading about it, it says that when Rebecca was pregnant with the twins, she could feel this, like, anger on the inside of her between the two boys. Like, they would fight in the womb. 
It's kind of crazy, right? Like she knew what was going on. She could tell that there was this, this high energy and this, this frustration between the two, okay? And it bothered her so much that she actually inquired to the Lord and wanted to know, what is this I'm sensing? Like what, what is going on inside of me? So the Lord told her that there were two nations on the inside of her and they were wrestling together, okay? So they wrestled in the room and God tells Rebecca that there are two nations within her and the older will serve the younger. Okay, so Rebecca's learning things early on before she even has these boys about what's going to happen. So the younger brother is going to be over the older brother, right? Or the older brother is going to serve the younger, okay? How do you guys feel about serving your, your younger brother, your younger sister? Does that sound cool? Cameron. <laughs> Cameron Does it sound that cool, right? Cameron said it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. That's crazy. It is crazy. Because, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a firstborn, so I don't know what it's like to have an older sibling, but I know when I was growing up, my, my younger siblings, they, they listen to me, right? So the idea of serving a, a younger sibling, it sounds crazy. Well, here's what happened. So Esau is born first. And when Jacob is born, he's born second, and he's grabbing the heel of his brother Esau. Okay, so Esau comes out first. And then Jacob's literally got his arm attached to Esau as he's being born. Okay, <laughs> this is actually where we get the name Jacob, because the name Jacob means heel grabber. Okay. Bro, his, his special was his first ankle grabber. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. So he got the name Jacob because he was a heel grabber. He was grabbing his brother's heel. Okay? Another meaning for Jacob is actually deceiver. Okay? That's kind of intense. Anyone want to be called a deceiver? You do? You what? Wait, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll switch his name Jacob. What well, you said, I thought he was so that's what's cool about this story, all right? So listen, it starts one way, and it's going to end the other way, okay? So this is just from the very beginning. So Jacob's born. He's already grabbing his brother's heel, right? He's, he's kind of trifling already, right? <laughs> okay, so that's where he got his name originally was Jacob, but another name for Jacob is Deceiver, which is kind of not encouraging, right? But we're going to see why he was named Deceiver, okay? So, Esau is born first, Jacob is born second, grabs his brother's heel, he's named Jacob, okay? So these two brothers, they're very different from each other. They grow up, okay, they're not babies anymore. Esau grows up to be a hunter. So he's got a big beard, he's tough, he's always outside, he's hunting for the family, he's cooking, you know, bringing meals home, uh, animals home for his family. So he's an outdoorsman, he's really tough. Now Jacob, on the other hand, is the opposite. Jacob's just a straight up mama's boy. Is he a poet? Okay? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so Jacob is not like his brother Esau. He's not tough on the outside. He's not out in the mountains. He's not hunting. He's at home. In fact, the Bible says he dwelled in tents. That's exciting, right? So Jacob liked to stay home but with his mama. He liked to play it safe. He wasn't out there really working too hard. He just kind of kept to himself. Okay, so very different. Two different men here. So let's move on. So one day, Esau is out hunting, okay? He's out hunting, he's gathering food for his family, and he comes in, he's so exhausted. He's exhausted, he's hungry, he's tired, he just wants to eat something, okay? So he's desperate. And Jacob, he realizes this. In fact, I think he kind of planned it. Jacob saw his brother come in, he's super tired, desperate, hungry, and Jacob said, or actually Esau asked Jacob first, why don't you make me something to eat? You make me some stew, okay? He's hungry. So Jacob, in his mind, he's going to start to learn more about Jacob. He sees that his brother has a need. He needs something from him. So now Jacob responds and says, I'll make you some stew if you give me your birthright. Anyone know what a birthright is? I don't know what that is. Average living compensation to it. You know what it is? Okay. It's not something we really have much anymore, okay, in most cultures. But in biblical times, way back in the day, like this story, the birthright always went to the firstborn. Okay, so if you were the oldest in your family, that was a big deal. It was a very serious custom to make that you got twice as much blessing, twice as much inheritance as your little brothers and sisters. So when your family passed away, when your parents went away, all that good stuff went to you. So if you had a wealthy family, it wasn't up for grabs. You didn't split it three ways. The one with the birthright got the most blessing. Okay, so that went to Esau. He was the oldest. And Jacob knew that. 
So Esau came in. He's hungry. He said, brother, fetch me some stew. I'm really hungry. Give me something to eat. And Jacob responds this way. He says, if you sell me your birthright, I'll give you this stew. Does that sound like a fair trade? He sounds like a big meanie. He, he does sound like a big meanie, huh? Yeah. So does that sound fair at all? Absolutely. I mean, to get some Absolutely. <laughs> To get a bowl of stew, some soup, and then give away your inheritance. That's kind of crazy, right? But what do you think Esau said? No. He said, sure, bro. Give me the stew. What? He said, sure. He was hungry. He was desperate. But the Bible also says that he despised his birthright. So he didn't really value it too much, right? If you give it up just for a bowl of soup. So that's fair to say. So he, he sold his birthright to his brother. He didn't really think it was that big of a deal. He kind of just did it because he needed something from him. So he just, he bowed down. He said, sure, you have my birthright. Give me something to eat, okay? So moving on, some years pass after this had happened, and Isaac, you guys remember Isaac, Jacob's dad? Isaac is dying. Yeah, he's on his deathbed. Well, back then, when you were on your deathbed, it's time to give a final blessing to your firstborn, the one with the birthright, okay? So... Esau still thinks he's going to get that blessing. Obviously, he didn't take Jacob too seriously that day. So Esau is expecting to get this blessing from his dad before he passes away. Well, what Isaac says to Esau, he says, go out and fetch me uh, some venison. Venison is nowadays typically deer, but back then it's used for different kinds of animals. So he said, go get me an animal and cook me a stew, because that's what Esau was famous for, right? So to go fetch me an animal and make me a stew to eat. And then I will bless you. Okay? So Esau takes off. So he goes out for the day. And he's out there doing what his father asked so that he could come back and get his blessing. Okay? So, meanwhile, Jacob, where's Jacob at? Where's Jacob always? He's at home. Right? He's chilling with mom. So Rebecca overhears, that's his mom, overhears that Esau's going to get the blessing today. So Rebecca talks to, to Jacob and gives him an idea. And Jacob's got to listen. It's still his choice. So this idea is your brother just went out in the mountains. Now Isaac, he's about to die. So he was almost blind. Pretty much he was blind. Okay, So he couldn't see very well. He was really on his last leg. So Jacob and Rebecca came up with the great idea to pretend, have Jacob pretend to be Esau go up into his dad's deathbed and get the blessing that is supposed to be going to Wait, Esau. is this the mom? That's yeah. Said? Yes. Mm -hmm. She's trifling too. She's trifling too. Yes, we're learning that, okay? <laughs> so this comes from the mom, but Jacob says, okay, let's do it. So again, remember Jacob and Esau, they're very different. They're even different builds. Esau was very hairy. He was masculine. He had a beard. So what Rebecca told Jacob to do was to attach goat skins to his arms. I mean, this is crazy, right? Can't make this up. So he put goat skins on his arms so that he would resemble his brother more, okay? So that it would feel like his brother when he went to his dad. So Jacob does, does this whole thing. He goes in there and he pretends to be his brother Esau. He gets the blessing from Isaac, okay? So he straight up did the deed. He stole his brother's inheritance by pretending to be him. So he was a deceiver, right? Now you kind of see why his name is Jacob, why they call him a deceiver. So he's really stepping into that. Okay, so how do you think Esau feels at this point? Betrayed. Huh, betrayed? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, he's hot, right? He's hot, so he comes back, he finds out what happens, and he says, I'm gonna kill him. That's literally how he felt. He was gonna kill his brother. So, what do you think Jacob did? He ran, absolutely. He didn't want to face up to that. He wanted to own up to his mistake, to his lie. Mm -hmm. Right? He ran away. He wanted to protect himself and get away and, and survive, if possible. Okay, so a lot going on here. So Jacob, he flees. And back then, the, the blessing was done. Isaac blessed Jacob, thinking it was Esau. That's it. There's no do-overs. There's no, let's do it over again. Jacob got the inheritance. Okay, but he got it by lying. So he lied his way into that. Okay. So, where are we at now? A lot going on here, like I said. So we're going front to back, just kind of summarizing, and then we're going we're gonna to focus in on something. So, after Jacob flees, he runs away by himself. He's terrified, right? He just lied to his whole family. He just took everything from his brother, and he ran. So Jacob 
goes away, and he actually has a dream. Okay, so he has a dream that night. And in the dream, he receives a blessing from God similar to the blessing of Abraham. Who can tell me in here, I know it was a few weeks ago, what was the blessing of Abraham? What did God tell Abraham he would do for him? That was part of it. That was part of it. That was a test, right? But what was what was God's promise to Abraham? What did He promise Abraham? Go ahead. Have many sons. Yes, that He would have many sons. In fact, more than the stars in the sky, right? More than the grains of sand on the earth. So nations would be blessed through Him. Okay. So God has a promise to hold up, and we're going to learn how much God cares about His word and what He says. Okay. So. Again, Jacob, he runs away, he's terrified, he goes to sleep, he has a dream that night, and God visits him and says, I'm going to give you a blessing from God. So he blesses, he blesses Jacob, and it's going to be similar to the blessing of Abraham. Okay, we're going to read that scripture when we get to that point. But he essentially says, you're going to be blessed. Nations are going to be blessed through you. If you do what I say, then you will be blessed. So does that sound about right? Jacob just lied to his whole family, ran away. Is some pretty messed up stuff. And then he has a dream of God blessing him. Does, does that sound right? No. That's kind of crazy, right? You wouldn't expect that yeah. from God after doing something so terrible. Would you expect God to show up in your dream and, and tell you that you're going to have favor with him? No. Not really, right? That's not how we work. But we're going to learn about God. So, after Jacob has the dream, he says, let it be so, Lord. Let it be as you have said. In, in other words, he... He listens to God and he says, I'm going to follow you. If you hold up your end of the deal, then I'm going to hold up my end of the deal. I'm going to follow you. Okay? So Jacob builds an altar and makes a vow to follow the Lord wherever he takes him. He's got nothing to lose at this point, right? His, his brother wants to kill him, literally trying to kill him if he finds him. So he runs off and he's actually going to stay with his uncle. And his uncle's name is Laban. Okay? So he kind of flees a few miles some direction and goes to stay with Laban. All right? So, where, when he's with Laban, he meets the love of his life, Rachel, and has many children, including Joseph. Now, keep in mind, guys, this is something that you guys are going to want to read for yourselves. At youth, when we're here, it's not to supplement reading the Bible. We're hoping to give you enough to want to learn it for yourselves, because if you go read the story of Jacob, when you go read this, it's crazy. He didn't just get to Rachel right away. Rachel was the love of his life, okay? Also his first cousin, but hey, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just telling you, <laughs> it was different back then, okay, God changed some things after this, but listen, yeah, it's crazy, <laughs> so Jacob falls in love with Rachel, but he doesn't get her right away, he has to wait, he has to work seven years to get her, and then when he finally does, things go crazy, okay, so Jacob wasn't treated very nicely, the guy who didn't treat others nicely, but he finally gets Rachel, he has multiple children along the way, and he works very hard for his uncle. Okay, so you can kind of see this change happening in Jacob, right? He starts out as this lying, deceiver, manipulating everybody, taking away stuff, stealing things. And then he now is working hard and he's pursuing God and listening to what God wants him to do. So after a long seven to ten years with his uncle, he wants to move on with his life. Okay, he wants to go take his children take all the flocks and the sheep and the goats, all these animals that he has now. He wants to go start a life for his own, away from his uncle, right? So he goes to do that. So when he does that, he actually goes back to his hometown, so where he came from. Okay, so he takes his, his wife, his children, and all his animals. So when Jacob is headed back to his hometown all these years later, guess who he's about to run into? Esau, his brother. How do you think Jacob feels? Scared. <laughs> oh, he's scared, boy. He's scared, for sure. He hasn't even talked to Esau. He hasn't seen him. So what do you think Jacob's afraid of? Yeah, getting killed, right? It's been a long time. Jacob's got all this favor, right? He, he really worked hard. He has a lot going for him. Now he's about to run into his brother who he stole from and ran away from years ago. So what Jacob does... Because he's a wealthy man at this point. He has a lot of animals. He has a lot of things that hold up value. So he sends up these animals and stuff ahead of his family to meet Esau as a gift. So in other words, 
he's sorry, right? He's sorry. He, he only has so much to offer. So he sends up these animals and whatever he has to his brother. And he wants his servants to say, hey, this is from your brother Jacob. You know, accept these. He's, he's saying sorry. He wants to make amends, right? But he's terrified. So once that happens, where are we at? So Jacob sends gifts ahead to his brother Esau in hopes of forgiveness. And then something crazy happens. This is one of the craziest stories. I think in the Bible, there's nothing like it. It says, no. So he sends everything ahead of him, his wives, his children, his animals. He's by himself now. Okay. So Jacob's rolling with everything he's got. Now he's by himself. The Bible says that Jacob wrestled with God. What? What does that mean? Wrestle. How do you wrestle with God? That's crazy, right? So what happened was, and we're going to read it here in just a second, but what happened was, is Jacob's all by himself, and a man shows up, and this man starts wrestling with him, and won't leave him alone, okay? And he keeps wrestling and wrestling, and finally, they wrestle all night long, and Jacob finds out that it was actually God that he was wrestling with. Do we think that God could actually come into a man's body and show up to us? Probably. He's yeah. God. That's right. What do you think? Huh? Talk about getting present. Yeah. And he showed up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he didn't know it at first, but by the time they were done wrestling, he knew who he was wrestling with. It was, it was the Lord himself. And what happened in that wrestling match is the man, who was actually God, blessed Jacob and changed his name to Israel. All right. You guys ever had a name change before? That's a pretty big deal, right? Sometimes. <laughs> So his name literally went from Jacob to Israel. This man changed his name. God changed his name. Okay? And then he blessed him. So this happens. He, he understands that it was God. And he goes ahead to meet his brother Esau. So Esau comes over the mountain. He's got 400 troops with him. He's got a whole army with him. What do you think Esau does to Jacob? <laughs> huh? Nope. He embraced him. Esau embraces Jacob. You guys know what it means to be embraced? No. It's like to hug. Awesome. Right? To hug, to, to really be connected with somebody. It's like love being connected. So his brother didn't kill him. He didn't ask him, why did you steal from me? Why did you do all this crazy stuff? He actually embraced him. And Jacob pretty much fell on his face crying because his brother actually was accepting his, his apology. And there was forgiveness there. Okay? So it's a good ending, right? It's a good ending. He didn't get he didn't get shot. He didn't get shot up or knocked out by his brother. They, they got close again. Okay. And then Jacob returns to Bethel, where he made his original vow to God. So remember in the beginning when he had the dream and he woke up and he built the altar to God and just promised him that he would follow him? That's where Jacob ended up going back to. Okay? What do you guys think about this story of Jacob? There's a lot of turns, right? A lot of twists. What's different from the beginning when you get to the end? What changed in Jacob? He started following God. Yeah. What about his name? Israel. There was like one country that was named Israel. Yeah. Absolutely. That was God's people, right? So he named, he named Jacob Israel. He changed his name to Israel, and that was God's place. That's, I mean, that's where Jesus, that's where Jesus walked, right? That's a big deal. Out of all the names he could have given Jacob, he made it Israel. So God was very fond of Jacob. What about all the things that he did? What about being a liar and a manipulator and a deceiver? Why did God have favor with him? Uh, oh, I thought you raised your hand. Yeah. Because he's forgiving. Absolutely. Right? Does Jacob remind you guys of anybody? <laughs> See, what I love about Jacob is that we read a story about a man who was born into sin, just like we were. Right? He did really bad stuff, just like we do. But God didn't leave him there. Right? He didn't, dis he didn't disregard this man because he was bad, because he did bad things. In fact, didn't he do the opposite? He actually pursued this man. It was very unlovable. He didn't really deserve much, 
I mean, who wants to hang out with a deceiver? Who wants to actually give things to a liar who stole from his whole family? That doesn't seem right. Not, we don't really like to hang out with people like that. But our God actually pursued him and changed his whole life. That's a big deal. So what I love, yeah, you got a question? You're one way, then you get saved, and now you're, now you're different, right? Now you start doing different things. You start wanting different things. Things matter that didn't matter before. You start changing. That's what I love about Jacob. And what you guys are going to find when you read this, when you read your Bible, like I said at the beginning, is look for yourself. I always like to interpret the Bible like it's a mirror. Look for yourself in there, because these are just people. They're people just like us. Yeah, it was a long time ago, and things were different, and they were different. But things change over time, but they're still the same people that we are. And God chose them in spite of their sin, in spite of the evil that they did. God saw something different. Okay? So, what I love about the story of Jacob is that it starts one way and it ends another. You take one man who's a certain way and you change him, now he's a different man. He's so different that he gave him a new name. So that's a big deal, right? So, I really want to focus on this transformation of Jacob, how his name was literally deceiver, and now his name is Israel. I mean, his name must, his name might as well have been evil, and now it's good. Like, that's how bad it was. That's how big of a change that he experienced. So, first of all, God chose Jacob in spite of who he was. So do you think that God chose Jacob because he qualified? I mean, God did choose Jacob, though, right? He showed up in the dream himself and said he was going to bless him. And then he eventually led him all the way through those years and then changed his name. So it's fair to say that God chose Jacob, right? But he looked past. He, he, he chose him in spite of his wickedness. He was obviously evil, but he still chose him. That's what I love about that. And that's what he does to us. Because we might not look evil on the outside. We might not be doing things that other people are doing. But eventually you start to realize that there is this evil on the inside of us that we need to take care of. And that's what Jesus came to do, right? That was his job. So God chose Jacob in spite of who he was. God knew Jacob would choose him back, resulting in the fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham. So here's what I love. Remember we talked about Abraham. God made a promise. What happens when we make a promise? What does that mean? Why is that important? Huh? You never break it, right? I mean, if you're saying, I promise, that means that you have a dis you have the intent of keeping your word, right? So God promised Abraham that there would be nations upon nations blessed through him. Well, here we have Jacob, his grandson, right? The blood continues to go and he keeps having children. Now we're, now we're here with Jacob and he's evil. So, can we agree that God cared about his promise to Abraham so much that he still chose Jacob? He still chose Jacob, even though he was, he was full of sin and full of evil. He cared so much about the promise, what he said out of his mouth to Abraham, that he had to work with Jacob, right? Jacob was his grandson. He's like, all right, this is what I got. God can do anything, right? He can do it in you and me and Jacob. He can change anybody. So he had a promise to uphold. And God's word is full of these promises, and you're going to see these promises are so important for us to hold on to. They're only as good as we're able to believe that we have to trust in the promises of God. So he fulfilled his promise to Abraham. So I want to talk about the, the dream. Okay, so this is, how, this is how God showed up to Jacob after he lied to his whole family and ran away. This is what it says. So Jacob fell asleep. Okay, this is right after he ran away. And he had a dream. And here's what it says. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. Okay, so imagine this is your dream. You're laying down sleeping, and there's a big stairway up to heaven. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. Jacob's like, me? Belongs to me? I just, I, 
I just stole from my brother. So the ground you're lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I'm with you. So he's not just going to give things to Jacob. He also says, I'm with you. And I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty big promise, right? God's saying a whole lot there. He's not only saying he's going to have a bunch of kids and they're going to be blessed, nations upon nations, but he's going to stay with Jacob no matter what. He's going to guide him. He's going to bring him back to where he left from. So Jacob's kind of put in this position. He either has to believe God or he has to dip out, right, and reject him. So he chooses to make a vow and hold God to his promise. And it's only when we do that, it's only when we take the word of God and believe it, that God gets to do what he wants in our life. Because if we don't believe that God's going to do what he says he's going to do, and we just run the other way, what does that cost? Like, how, how does that benefit our relationship with the Lord if we don't believe what he says he's going to do? It causes us to go do crazy things, and now we're not operating in the ways of God, right? So that's what happened in the dream. So what I love is that God saw who Jacob would be, not for who he was. God didn't leave Jacob where he was. This is why he changed his name. So God didn't just take an imperfect man who was full of sin and evil and just stole from his family and leave him that way, did he? He, he? he took him and he was one way, but he said, I have a plan for you. And this is what he does for all of us. He doesn't just take you where you are right now and say, all right, I'll take you and you can be my child and we're gonna do this thing and you're gonna stay the same. And you're gonna suffer your whole life and you're gonna go through the things that you go through. No, he says, I'm gonna take you the way that you are, exactly how you are. And I'm going to take you for a ride, and you're going to be different by the end of it. That's his purpose. That's his plan for all of us. He shows up one way, but he takes us into a different place. He makes us different, just like he did with Jacob, right? Okay, so when Jacob wrestles with God, I want to read the scripture, what it says about this encounter he had with God himself. And what does it mean? I mean, I'll be honest. When I read in the Bible that Jacob wrestled with a man and it turned out he was God, that's kind of crazy, right? Like, what does that even mean? How do you wrestle with a man when it's God? Why did he wrestle? What is that? What's, why, why is that important, right? Well, let's read what the scripture says. So during the night, so this is just before Jacob saw his brother, right? He knew he was about to see his brother. How do you, how do you think Jacob was feeling? He was afraid, right? So I, like I said, I want you guys to picture this as you. Apply Jacob's life to your own life when you're afraid, when you're about to do something that scares you, when you're not feeling too hot. So this is Jacob. This is what happened. So during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons. He had a lot of family, right? <laughs> two wives, two servant wives, and 11 sons. <laughs> and crossed the, the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. So all his family, all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. I think that felt. <laughs> so wait a second. So God and Jacob are wrestling, and God grabs Jacob by the hip and breaks his hip. That's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Like, what, what does that mean, right? Why would God break his hip? Why are they wrestling? What's going on? So let's keep reading. So, let's see here. When the man saw, okay. So his hip broke. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you'll be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. So what do we think is going on here? Why do we think, if this is God, which it is, and he's wrestling with Jacob, 
Why did he ask what his name was? Oh, I know. Sure. What else? So he can change it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, for sure. Now, if we're looking back at the story, who else asked for Jacob's name? Remember at the beginning? So remember when he stole the birthright from Esau? Oh, I thought Jacob asked God what his name was. No, God asked Jacob, what is your name? Because Jacob was fighting it, and, and God was like, let me go. It's, it's almost daybreak, let go of me. And Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And then God said, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. So back to the beginning, there's a significance here. Remember when Jacob stole the birthright from Esau? Isaac, his dad, reached out his hand and felt the hairy arms. And he said, what is your name? And Jacob said, my name is Esau. Remember, he lied. Mm -hmm. So that's why he got blessed. Because he said, my name is Esau. So he lied, pretending to be his brother. And then his dad blessed him. So now you fast forward to the end. Jacob's wrestling with the Lord, and the Lord says, what is your name? And Jacob finally says, my name is Jacob. So there's a significance here, and this is really important for each of you. And I've had this in my own walk, in my own life. Sometimes we're not really straight up with God. Raise your hand if you've ever not been straight up with God. Like, not totally, like, kind of, but not really. Okay, so that was Jacob. That's what he did his whole life. He, he ran from God. He lied to everybody. But now he's face to face. He's wrestling with God and he gets asked a question. Now it's time to be honest. So what's important here is being straight up with God. Instead of lying and saying, oh, I'm, I'm Esau like he did before, you know, how he's used to doing. He said, my name, is Esau, my name is Jacob. And it was after he was honest with God, full of pain, full of fear, about to probably get killed by his brother. He was real with God about where he was. And then the blessing came. Because sometimes we don't realize God wants to bless who we really are, not who we pretend to be. And Jacob was really good at pretending to be someone that he wasn't. Right? Are we kind of picking that up? He was constantly putting on a face or a different name, pretending he was someone that he wasn't. Have we ever done that before? Yeah. We're, we're a certain way inside, but we look a different way outside. Or we're this way with our friends, but we're this way with our family. So... I believe there's, there's power behind this story because we all wrestle with God. He wrestles with all of us. And what God is saying, what the word is saying is that if you want the blessing, who wants to be blessed? I mean, for real, who wants to be blessed? Everything you do, your whole family, health, wealth, salvation, peace, joy. Who wants that? Everybody, right? Well, sometimes God's asking you, what is your name? Or what are you going through? How do you feel? What's really going on? And we're telling him something that's not totally true. So God can only work with what we give him. Mm. Amen? Amen? So when he asks us, what is your name? We better get real because there's a blessing. He wants us to be honest with him, not so he can stricken us, not, not so he can beat us, so he can bless us. But if we don't tell God what's going on, how's he going to bless us? He's waiting for us to respond. Right? So... When you're praying tonight, when you're at home, when you're at school this week, this upcoming week, whatever it is, and you're, you're battling things inside, God doesn't want the pretty stuff. He wants everything else. He wants everything else that you're going through that your parents don't know about. You won't tell your friends because they'll just judge you and, and, and leave you. You don't even tell your pastors because, like, what if they don't understand? God wants all of that. He wants the truth so that he can bless you where you're really at. Because if we pretend to be over here, but we're actually not, we're over here. How's God going to work with that? He's going to try to bless you when you're not even over here. Amen. And I can tell you guys right now, and I hope, that, I hope this lands somewhere. I hope that you guys hear what I'm saying. The most I've ever received from the Lord, when I really found change, when I really found peace, when I really found God doing something in my life, finally, it wasn't until I got real. It wasn't until I got real with God. Because he knows you. He made you. He's your father. He knows everything. He knows every thought you have. He knows how you feel on the inside. He knows everything that's happened to you. But for some reason, we sometimes we approach him differently. Like he doesn't really know the whole picture. Or we can't really tell him the whole, the whole thing. So what I can tell you from experience, and this is biblical, is that there's breakthrough. There's blessing when you can get honest with the Lord. When you can tell him really what's going on with you. 
Because he's your father. He wants to take care of you. He wants to help you where you're at. But you got to tell him where you're at. And you got to be real with where you're at. Amen? So they got into a big fight. Now, what I love about this, too, let's just look at this fight, this, this wrestling match, before we close up and just point out a couple of things. Who was with Jacob when he wrestled with God? Who was there with him? Nobody, right? All the people that he knew, all the people that loved him, all the comfort, it went away. Right? That's where God wants to meet with us. Not on the stage, not at the party, not with all of our friends. It's not that he won't meet us there, but he wants that alone time with us because that's when we can get real. That's when, that's when our true face comes out. You guys relate to that? It's when you're all by yourself and your friends aren't there watching you, your family's not there watching you. That's when you're most vulnerable. That's when you, what's really going on comes to the surface. That's where he wants to wrestle with you. That's where he wants to bless you. God wants to wrestle with you because he wants to give something to you. He wants to bless you, okay? So oftentimes it's when we pull away from the crowd where we have that, that intimacy with the Lord. So, the sun was rising. Okay, this is important. So after that story, at the very end of the fight, he got his name changed, he got blessed, right? The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. All right? So remember, God broke his hip. Real generous. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? So God broke his hip, so he really hurt him. All right? So I want you to hear me right now. When, when we limp, okay, when we limp, we lean. I need a volunteer. Someone raise their hand. All right, come on. Okay, come here. So I'm Jacob, right? And I just got my, I just got tore up by the Lord. My, my hip is broken. Okay, so come over. Actually, you can stay right there. Yeah, come right here. Come right here. So I'm Jacob. My hip's broken. So I'm limping now. Come here. I need some help. Give me your arm. Okay. If I'm going to keep going, if I'm going to walk, I'm going to need some help. Right? Fair enough? So let's, let's walk a few steps. This is going to be me. All right? Am I putting pressure on you? Are you helping me? Help me out, bro. <laughs> My head's broken. Help me out. Right? Okay. So sit down. I wanted you to see that because that's Jacob. He was tore up. His hip was broken. And it said that he left that place with a limp. In fact, a lot of people say that Jacob lived the rest of his life. Why is that important? So when I'm limping, I'm leaning on something. I need someone's help. Okay? Who do you think Jacob was leaning on the rest of his life? The Lord. Amen? The Lord. He got his hip broken. And now he wasn't leaning on his lies. He wasn't leaning on his manipulation. Like, Jacob was a salesman. He was super good. Right? He could lie his way through, through situations. He wasn't leaning on that anymore. He had a limp. And I think that the significance of the limp is his new direction. How he had to lean on the Father in a way that he didn't before. So he had to put his all his pressure, right? All of his uncertainty, all of his fears, all of his insecurities. He had to put that on the Lord. Because that's who broke his hip. Right? And you guys are going to understand this. I'm sure some of you already do. Sometimes we don't actually get blessed until we get broken. Just like Jacob. A lot of times in my life, it's at my lowest broken moments where I come out more blessed than I've ever been. Because guess what? If I'm doing pretty good in my own in my own mind, and I'm successful and things are going my way, you think I'm you think I'm praying? You think I, I feel like I need God? Not as much. Right? I mean, when do you guys seem to pray the most? When do you seem to think about God the most when you have a need? Right? When, when something's not going right. So that's by design. Because we're designed to need our Father. We're designed to need His guidance and to lean on Him. And the truth is, is that we're all broken. It's not just Jacob and his broken hip. We're all born broken. But as soon as we can realize that brokenness, the sooner we can lean on the Father and get the help that we're designed to get from Him. So, remember that. It's in our brokenness that the Lord blesses us. Now, I'm not saying go pursue brokenness, go hurt yourself, like go look for pain. That's not what it is. But all of us carry different types of pain. And when we take that pain to God, we give him something that he can work with. 
If you just go to God and pretend like everything's okay, and you're not disappointed with anything, and you're not struggling with anything, you, you don't need anything, what, what are you able to receive from the Lord? Like, if you come to me, and I have so much to give you, but you come to me and say, well, I actually don't need anything, what can I give you? But when you come to the Lord with your brokenness and your need, he's able to bless you. He's able to give things to you, and that's what he wants to do. Amen? So, we got to get broken before we get blessed. So, I want to end, I want to close this up with this idea of wrestling with God. Now that we broke it down a few different ways, we've looked at it a little bit, what are some ways that we, we, we can wrestle with God? What do you think are some ways that we tend to wrestle with God? Anybody have anything? You ever felt like you're just wrestling with God? There's no wrong answer. Go ahead. Uh, resisting against like certain paths that he wants us to go on. Okay, that's really good. So in a way, you're, you're kind of resisting like his will, right? Like what, like what you know he wants you to do, but you're resisting God. Yeah. Absolutely. Anybody else? How can we wrestle with God? Go ahead. Absolutely. Yep. So when you feel like an inclination, maybe in the spirit, that you should check on somebody, but you don't do it, God bless you. So a lot of times it's it's this voice, it's this this feeling that the Lord wants us to do something, but we, we don't do it or we, we look the other way, right? So there's a lot of ways that we wrestle with God. So that's one of them, when we know the right thing to do and we don't do it. Or wrestling with God can look like something else. Like look at what Jacob did. Jacob was wrestling with God, but he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Mm -hmm. Jacob said that to the Lord. He said, you're not going anywhere. In fact, the Lord is the one that said, I got to go. Let me go. It's daybreak. And Jacob said, no, I'm not letting you go. You need to bless me. Sometimes we got to get that way with God. He wants us to get that way. Why do you think he said, I got to go? He was testing Jacob. How long are you going to stay? How long are you going to stand on the word of God? How long are you going to believe a promise before you feel it? How long are you going to actually trust him for your life before he shows up in a way that you want him to? So that's how we wrestle with God. Sometimes wrestling with God is believing a promise before you see it. I mean, Abraham died believing a promise that he never saw. But look what happens. Nations upon nations upon nations. We're all descendants of Abraham. That's a lot of people. So sometimes when we wrestle with God, it's refusing to give up. It's refusing to back down from the place that we are. Knowing that he's our provider, knowing that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. But again, you guys, we can't hold him. We can't take him for his word if we don't know what his word says. And that's why it all comes back to the word of God and what it says. If you don't know what God promises you, how do you know what to expect from him? How do you know what to ask for? How do you know what to need until you know what he already promised you in his word? So sometimes when we wrestle with God, it's refusing to move. I'm not moving until you bless me. I know what your word says. I know what you promised me. I know what you want to do in my life. I haven't seen it yet, but am I going to back away? Am I going to give up because I had a hard day and it didn't really go my way? No, I'm going to stand because my God is my Lord and he said what he said go. And what he said he's going to do in your life, he's going to do in your life. But sometimes we got to wrestle with that. we got to stay in the fight. we got to, we got to stand firm. Amen. So yes, that's what's beautiful about it. I believe that Jacob was wrestling in both ways. He was wrestling against his own insecurities, his fears, his sin, what he did in the past. But he also had a promise from God that he tucked right here in his pocket. Actually, he put it in his heart. And he said, Lord, I'm not moving until you bless me. I don't care that you broke my hip. I'm not letting go of you until you give me what you said you were going to give me. You think God respects that? Because <laughs> that's just a reflection of how much we trust him. That's a reflection of how much, how, how we think of him. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Trusting in his character. Mm -hmm. Waiting for a prayer to be answered. Sometimes when you pray, it doesn't, you don't get your answer right away. You ever just kept praying though? How many times have we prayed and the next day, the situation was still the same, but you prayed again. And you kept praying. I mean, the Bible says never stop praying, right? So just by knowing that, you know how prayer works sometimes. In the spirit, sometimes things take time. So wrestling with God could be refusing to stop praying. 
for that family member, that friend at school, whatever it is, that person who's struggling, who's sick. You said, I don't see them healed yet, but they will be. And I'm going to keep praying because of that. Because I have no idea what happens in the spirit realm when we just refuse to back down. We refuse to let go of God. There's angels, there's principalities, there's things that we don't even see that are at war right now all around us. And when we refuse to let go of God and we refuse to back down, things change and things happen. Mm -hmm. So keep on praying even when you don't see the answer yet. Taking God at his word sometimes is wrestling. And allowing ourselves to fully surrender to the Father's will. Repentance, confession, submissiveness. I'm sorry, but do you think that Jacob surrendered when he got his hip broke? I mean, he didn't let go, but I mean, he definitely knew it was the Lord, right? He definitely got weakened a little bit, right? So sometimes when we wrestle with God, it's, it's coming to terms. It's getting real with ourselves. Like we talked about before, getting honest so that we can, accepting our brokenness so that we can get blessed. So we wrestle with God. A lot of times it's just eventually you start to keep hearing that you have to do this, you have to do this. There's something that he's asking of you. And sometimes it's delayed obedience. And it's coming to terms with what the Lord wants for our life, even if it's not what we had in mind or we had planned. So I can tell you guys this, that the beautiful thing about Jacob's story is that it's every one of our story. God took a man who was evil by nature, did terrible things, didn't deserve anything, but he chose him because he saw who he would be, not who he was. And that's what he did with me and with each of you. He sees exactly who you're going to be the longer that you walk with him. He sees the finished product in you every single day. He doesn't see all of your sin and how terrible you are. He sees you as his child, especially when you accept his son, Jesus Christ, and his blood is over you. He sees what you're going to be. And that's why he stuck with Jacob. Because he knew that we had things to, to gain. Heaven had things to gain from Jacob's transformation to Israel. So understand this and take this home. As you read this story, read it like it's your own autobiography or biography, whatever the right term is. <laughs> read it as if it's a story about you because it is. That's why it's there. It's not just to learn about some guy named Jacob. It's about what does God want to do with me? Even though I mess up, even though I, I do bad things, even though I, I made mistakes, the Lord still chose you. And he wants to do things in your life and change your name and make you a completely different creature. When you accept Jesus Christ, you die and you literally become a new person. That's incredible. That's crazy. So that's literally what happened to Jacob. And that, that was a shadow of things to come. Jacob was one way and his whole name got switched and now he's a literally new person. That's what happens to each of us when we accept Jesus. Amen. So understand that the Lord sees what you don't see about yourself. And what I want you guys to go home and do, and when we worship tonight, when God asked Jacob what his name was, and he said Jacob, right? I want you to think about that. I want you to, I want you to pretend and meditate on the fact that God's asking each of you tonight, what is your name? And you can tell him your name, but tell him in your heart, tell him what you see about yourself that you don't like. Okay, because we all have it. So when God says, what is your name? Get real with him this time and tell him the way that you feel about yourself. Tell him what you're struggling with. Yes, your name is Paul. Your name is whatever your name is. But tell him what you really need help with. Because he wants to know. He wants to know what that brokenness is so that he can exchange it for a blessing. He wants to heal you. So when we worship tonight, I want you to pretend like the Lord because he is. I want you to pretend like he's asking you, what is your name? What is your addiction? What is your depression? What is your sadness? What is it that keeps you heavy? What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that hurts you and makes you angry? Tell him what it is. He can take it. Trust me. He can take it. If he can deal with Jacob, anybody ever stolen their sin birthright? No, we're all good then, right? KK, I think it. Oh, no. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so understand that the Lord is not afraid of your sin. He's not afraid of your brokenness. So get real with him. Let him see the broken parts of you. Tell him what your name is. Tell him the thing that you see about yourself that you don't want to see anymore. And let him give you a different name. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, let's pray. KK's going to, Pastor KK's going to put on a worship song. We're going to meditate with the Lord. So Father God, I thank you for this generation of children 
They come from heaven, Lord. I thank you that every person here was designed by you and called by you to destroy hell. What better thing can we do every day to make the devil mad and destroy hell for a living? So I pray, Lord, that these kids bury the word of God in their heart. I pray that they receive encouragement tonight, Lord. I pray that they get real with you during worship. And I pray that they continue to become the children that you've designed them to be. I pray that you continue to stoke the fire on the inside of them, Lord, so that they can be a bright light in every dark place that they go. Because you send the light where it's dark. So the point of being bright and filled with light is so that we can go to dark places and make them not dark anymore. In Jesus' name. So I thank you for equipping us, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for blessing these children, each and every one of them, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Thanks, Instagram. Love you guys. Bye.